All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of Kemp. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. And yes, mashallah, I am back home in Egypt. It has been quite the adventure over the past several weeks, and I have an immense mountain of exceptional footage that will all be coming out soon. But for now, this is episode 103, and I will be presenting some major critical concepts regarding the function of not only the Egyptian pyramids, but also the stone circles of ancient England and Ireland and their associated mound structures. Also in this episode, the amazing footage from our expedition to Windmill Hill, where we discovered some profound magnetic anomalies. These magnetic phenomenon were present at almost every site where we attempted to use a compass, accompanied by unexplained equipment malfunctions, all of which are directly related to these extremely ancient structures across the planet. So if this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient sites from across the world, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell, like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to help support this channel, check out The Land of Chem members only section, link in the video description below. Four major episodes have already been released that are exclusively for the initiates. If you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch, check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the Land of Chem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. So the first concept that requires explanation in regard to the function of the Egyptian pyramids and the ancient stone structures of England and Ireland is a magnetic field. And I will do my best to elucidate these ideas in the simplest terms possible. And I will quote here first from Encyclopedia Britannica, magnetic fields a vector. And by vector, we simply refer to something that has magnitude or power and direction. So a vector field in the neighborhood of a magnet, electric current, or changing electric field in which magnetic forces are observable. Magnetic fields such as that of the earth cause magnetic compass needles and other permanent magnets to line up in the direction of the field. Magnetic fields force moving electrically charged particles in a circular or helical path. And you can see here the shape of these circular or elliptical vectors surrounding various magnets and around the Earth itself. So first, remember the shape of these magnetic fields, as this will be specifically relevant in the next episode. And yes, the Earth does have a very powerful magnetic field, which I have presented and explained before in episode 79 regarding the inverse piezoelectric effect and ultrasound, link in the video description below. And the Earth's magnetic field is directly responsible for protecting the planet from the charged particles emanating from the sun during solar flares. And the interaction of these charged particles and the Earth's electromagnetic field is what causes the aurora borealis lights. So again, remember the shape of this magnetic field that you can see here. Next up, a concept of the utmost importance in understanding how these structures work is something called dielectrics. And I will quote again here, the basic definition of a dielectric from Encyclopedia Britannica. Dielectric, is an insulating material or very poor conductor of electric current. When dielectrics are placed in an electric field, practically no current flows in them because unlike they have no loosely bound or free electrons that may drift through the material. Instead, electric polarization occurs. The positive charges within the dielectric are displaced minutely in the direction of the electric field and the negative charges are displaced minutely in the direction opposite to the electric field. So these dielectric materials do not conduct electricity, but they have overwhelmingly important properties that are expressed in a term called the dielectric constant, which is explained simply here. The relative permittivity 
is the permittivity of a material expressed as a ratio with the electric permittivity of a vacuum. A dielectric is an insulating material and the dielectric constant of an insulator measures the ability of the insulator to store electric energy in an electric field. So remember this critical explanation here. The dielectric constant of an insulator measures the ability of the insulator to store electric energy in an electrical field. Now, most of the hills and mound structures that you will see in the upcoming episodes contain high levels of chalk and limestone. And the stone circles are composed of sandstone with high levels of silicon dioxide. And I found varying ranges for the dielectric constant of chalk from around two, which you can see here, and up to around 4.5, which you can see here. And this list also contains the dielectric constant, again, the ability of this material to store electric energy of other relevant types of stone, such as limestone, also a form of calcium carbonate here at around six, and calcite, as mentioned before, in regard to the Egyptian pyramids at eight. So for now, just keep in mind that all of these construction materials have varying abilities to store electrical energy within these systems. And as mentioned in the episode at Stonehenge, and also as you will see at Avebury, we have stone circles made from siliceous sandstone that contain high levels of silicon dioxide, which is also a dielectric material with a dielectric constant of four. And as mentioned here, silicon dioxide is the most widely used dielectric for electronic applications. So these stones have extremely unique properties that are directly related to the operation of these systems. And I'll be explaining how everything works step by step over the next series of episodes. Today's lesson being step one in understanding the mechanics behind the building materials and the impetus for their selection which I have said since day one that all of these materials were chosen very meticulously and intentionally integrated into specific areas of each structure. And these monuments weren't just being built in Egypt, but all across the world, creating a complex global network of stone structures. All right, now on to the most important diagram and concept for today's episode the connection between the magnetic and dielectric fields. This coming from the prolific work titled Electric Discharges, Waves and Impulses and Other Transients by Charles Proteus Steinmetz. And I will quote directly here because this is critical to understand before we proceed. Starting here, the conductor is surrounded by a magnetic field or a magnetic flux, which is measured by the number of lines of magnetic force. With a single conductor, the lines of magnetic force are concentric circles as shown here in figure eight. By the return conductor, the circles are crowded closely together between the conductor and the magnetic field consists of eccentric circles surrounding the conductors as shown by the drawn lines in figure nine here. An electrostatic, or more properly called dielectric field, issues from the conductors, that is, a dielectric flux passes between the conductors, which is measured by the number of lines of dielectric force. With a single conductor, the lines of dielectric force are radial straight lines, as shown dotted here in figure eight. By the return conductor, they are crowded together between the conductors and form arcs of circles. Passing from the conductor to return conductor as shown dotted here in figure nine. The magnetic and the dielectric field of the conductors, both are included in the term electric field and these are the two components 
of the electric field of the conductor. So at the simplest level, just remember that an electrical field is composed of a magnetic field and a dielectric field. And I want you to imprint the shape of these fields in your mind as they will be a recurring theme over the next few weeks. And last but not least, before I reveal the footage from Windmill Hill, which in and of itself was not long enough for a full Sunday site visit, but it fits perfectly into the explanations contained within this episode. A quick discussion on how a compass works in relation to the Earth's magnetic field. And I will quote here, a compass is an instrument which is used to find the direction of a magnetic field. Again, as we mentioned, vectors that contain power or magnitude and direction. A compass consists of a small metal needle which itself is magnetized and which is free to turn in any direction. Therefore, when in the presence of a magnetic field, the needle is able to line up in the same direction as the field. And you are about to see what happened to our compass needle at every site where we attempted to get a reading, which is an indication that these sites were constructed in a very specific location. So for today, I will leave it at that. And I hope you enjoy this exclusive footage from a site you may have never heard of with another esoteric symbolism encoded name, Windmill Hill. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to help support the channel, just check out thelandofchem.com. I have the new six degree Green Lion logo, the fifth degree Central Pyramid Hydrochloric Acid logo, the new second edition print copy of the Land of Chem book, this beautiful new Egyptian blue edition, signed copies, extremely rare, only 89 copies in existence of the original first edition purple orchid paper print of the Land of Chem book are also available all at thelandofchem.com. So if you want to show some love, just check out the website. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for the support. All right, everyone, welcome back to day two of our epic expedition across the ancient megalithic landscape of England. And we have seven sites on the itinerary for today's adventure. And we are here walking down this little trail that you can see behind me in search of site number one. I won't spoil the surprise quite yet. Stay tuned. And this is going to be a fucking awesome day. Yalavina, let's go. All right, everyone, after quite a trek, we have reached our first destination, which is a site called Windmill Hill, an ancient prehistoric mound. And today, we are in search across the ancient landscape of England, looking for the connection and the evolution from the ancient stone and earth mounds of Europe and the development into the Egyptian pyramids. And this is site one. Windmill Hill, which as you can see from the landscape around us, this is by far the highest point of elevation in the near area. And this is a very significant detail that will be particularly relevant in our upcoming discussions. Everyone say hello to Alexa hello. from Ancient Odysseys. And if you wanna see the full trek that it took to get to this site, check out her channel. And we're going to take a quick walk around the mound structure so you can see the earthen enclosure. Our first comparison between the mounds and the Egyptian pyramids, the enclosures or the reservoirs surrounding these structures. is the mound itself. And as we approach the other side, I will show you one of our next destinations. 
And like I said before, today we are in search of the proto pyramids of Europe. The evolution between these ancient mounds and the Egyptian pyramids. And I don't know if you can see it there in the distance, but there is a structure right here called Silbury Hill, which we will be visiting in just a moment. And I wish you could see it. It looks like an absolutely massive towering green pyramid in the distance. It is quite a sight from here. And we will be up close in person to this ancient prehistoric man-made proto-pyramid here in just a moment. Stay tuned. Alright everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 103, Magnetic Anomalies, Dielectric Fields, and Windmill Hill. I really hope you enjoyed today's video and in the next two episodes in the series, episode 104, a major revelation regarding these magnetic and dielectric fields, and then Sunday Site Visit 35 from Avebury. These are two episodes you do not want to miss, so if you haven't already, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell, like, comment, and stay tuned if you want to help support the channel. Check out the Land of Chem members only section and thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up some merch or grab a copy of the book. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's episode, so I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.